bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa sadhu 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 hey so uh today what we're going to do I was uh, looking, this, this is a sutta that I really like for one particular reason. It's very interesting. We're, we're going to do number 140, the Datu Vibhanga Sutta. And um, a lot of it is listening, you know, just listening to the sections go through. I'll tell you uh, when the smooth ones come through, you can just sort of close your eyes and listen to it as it goes through, okay? But um, the interesting part about the sutta is how much the Buddha actually taught uh, um, Bukasate in the story within one, a period of one night inside of a potter shed. That this man was able uh, to go all the way to um, Anagami level. And I'm always, you probably have realized this if you've been around me, with Bhante teaching and me scribbling on whiteboards, I'm interested in capsulizing sort of what is the, the uh, smallest amount that person actually needs to understand in order to succeed in their meditation and comprehension level and be able to reach cessation and experiencing an opening, okay? And what is it that puts us in that position is the way he has very finely, very, very well put together this uh, nine or 10 day retreats that we do online and that we teach you um, in, in person. And these eight subjects that are tied together in a way uh, that they are usually not connected. That's what happens. Sunil is here, hello. <laughs> so, um, I, I want to speak to um, uh, someone about a question that was asked, but it's for all of you. So I was trying to come a little early to discuss this, but um, I can do it very briefly with you now. The question was, um, was about the uh, mantras that are used in Buddhism, and people like to use mantras uh, a lot to get ready for meditation and such. Now, there's a lot of little pieces to this. The mantras were not originally in the Buddhist teaching in the beginning. What was in the Buddhist teaching is whatever was supportive towards preservation of what was being taught was recited. This is how the preservation system actually began. And um, so when you, when you personally choose a mantra, the short way of talking about this is no matter which one you talk about, I, Sunil mentioned a few to me that people do, um, but the secret to this is translate it and understand what it's saying. Is it saying something that is in keeping with the teaching because whatever you start repeating gets drummed into your mind and you want to support the instructions precisely of what you're retraining your mind to do. You don't want to teach it something else. For instance, um, all right, I'm going to use Amitabha as, as a hypothetical example, okay? Because I, I loved going to Japan and I liked being at the conferences and in the largest temple in the world. I thought it was great. And you have 60 monks who take a breath and they go like this. They basically, 60 of them at one time. Amitabha, 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 Amitabha. Now, this gets even more interesting if you have a bunch of people who are doing this 
who have been doing yoga also, because they have very big breaths and all these monks can do about 40 of those. And then they roll their breath and they keep going and they keep going for a period of time in this mantra. Now the question is, what is Amitabha? So in Amitabha is kind of the opposite of where you're going right now. <laughs> So it causes a little bit of a problem if your brain should possibly understand that from some other lifetime. Amitabha's ushering you into um, the Pure Land in Pure Land Buddhism. And Pure Land Buddhism is a place where when you die the, to get to the Pure Land, you do as much as you possibly can that's good here now. To, and your whole intention of this life is to get into that land and then do go to Nibbana. This is interesting. And um, so getting to Nibbana in, in that tradition has decided it's probably not possible to get to Nibbana in this lifetime. That's one of the things that rolls around within those traditions. And you're encouraging this when in actuality, we're showing you something, a path that will take you directly to the waterfall that falls over into cessation and then you come back up and experience Nibbana. So you're not going to go there. It's almost as, I talked to Bhante about this one because I like it. <laughs> and I would go out in the woods with a chainsaw, you know, and I'm clearing land. I'm, Amitabha, 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 you know, for hours. And he said, you need to reevaluate this. And so we got on a discussion about mantras. So mantras, um, another one is Om, Omani Padme Om. Now Omani Padme Om, I can't remember um, what Omani Padme Om is, but I know it's a similar problem. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the translation. But um, of course, I liked Omani Padme Om. And you'll, you'll, for those of you who are Buddhist, this is kind of cute. But before I knew anything, I knew these monks at the, at the temple in Washington, DC, and I was teaching them English. And um, you know, the one monk, he would always say, oh, mani padme om, oh, mani padme om to me. And I was at the house once and, and he came in and he bowed to me because I did something for him. And then uh, it was kind of strange. And then uh, he said, oh, mani padme om, oh, mani padme om, oh, mani. And I said, I'm sure someone will soon. And he said, what? And I said, why do you keep saying, oh, mommy, take me home? And this is an American, an ignorant American. I didn't know what he was saying. And it sounded to me exactly like he was saying, oh, mommy, take me home, oh, mommy, take me home. And he wasn't in Kathmandu anywhere. <laughs> anyway. Uh, he straightened me out, <laughs> but it's a blessing. But the point is, what's the point? The point about mantras in a nutshell is the same thing that happened with Bhante when he was in Thailand. He was at a temple in um, uh, Chiang Mai and coming down the steps from the Chiang Mai bell, it's a big long staircase, and as he's coming down, an American ran up to him, uh, an, an English speaking person, and said to him, oh, you know, uh, he paid homage to Bhante, and then he said, um, would you listen, I've, I've memorized a, um, I've memorized some Pali, would you listen to me? And my teacher said, of course, and he sat down and the man, uh, recited the Pali beautifully to him. And he said, that's nice, isn't it? Did I do it correctly? And my teacher said, yes. And then my teacher, of, of course, because my teacher is the teacher, he said to the man, what does it mean? And the man, just his reaction was, what do you mean, what does it mean? And he said, well, what does it mean? What you just said when you recited this, what does it mean? And the man was indignant. He said, it's the sound of it. It's the tone of it. It's the quality of it. That's going to take you to Nibbana. 
And my teacher said, well, then why did you bother all this memorization? Why did you bother so long to memorize this? And the man said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you could have been walking around and saying, banana, 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 banana. And you could have gotten to Nibbana. And then the man was really upset. He said, the whole point of you memorizing anything or walking around uh, with mantra work is to always remember you're affecting the brain, you're teaching it something. And when you're training, you are training the way we're teaching you. When you're training uh, on a training line, you have to understand your brain starts listening to you, paying attention. And I try to make you understand your brain is like a two year old child, the way it learns. Brains learn new patterns of behavior when you go like this to it, exactly the same way, again and again. And finally, it will click onto automatic. And this is where your six R's will start automatically, or you will automatically understand something. And you, this is the way the brain works. If you don't believe me, go on the internet. I've told you where to go to look up how does a brain learn a new habit? You go and you watch, how do I change a habit if I'm over 21? And you'll go to some research and count, you'll find some summaries that explain the impingement on the brain is what changes the neural pathways of your brain. They are not stagnant, they are not fixed, they can be changed. The older you get, the more difficult it is for it to change because it's strongly established, but it can change. And the reason it changes is because you start a new neural pathway and this one sort of shrivels up and dries up and falls away. That's why. So the point is that uh, the difference between repeating mantras and chanting material in Buddhism was that the mantra supports and drives the mind home to operate in a pattern and take the information as the word. It's very firm. And when you're reciting uh, the many different things that monks recite at the temples in Theravada, uh, they're reciting things like the dependent origination forward and backwards. So what's that doing? Well, everything because how everything works is hidden in between the seven links that are in the 12 links and if you don't memorize them or decide to memorize them well then you need to start reciting them you can do it in poly or you can do it in english i don't care until you can do it automatically you see and you have your uh, automatically formations, consciousness, mentality, materiality, the sixth sense doors and contact and feeling and then craving and then clinging and habitual tendencies is Nabawa when we're talking about individual events. We are teaching you something. I found this out accidentally. <laughs> I was told my teacher was asked by a big monk from Canada. Uh, why are you teaching this woman this dependent origination this way? He was angry and my teacher looked, you know, it was a funny situation because my teacher is sitting here, standing here, and the monk is facing him here, and I'm over here behind him looking at my teacher, and I'm saying, so why did you teach me? <laughs> and he simply said to this really important monk, because she can't understand it. Yeah, and then the monk sort of stamped his foot and walked away because in that tradition, they had decided something. It became obvious to me right in that moment. In that tradition, the way to deal with dependent origination was to keep it inside the Sangha and just not share it with lay people. But what did the Buddha tell you in the Parinibbana Sutta that was so important? He told Ananda, he gave him everything to teach this Dhamma for everyone, and there was no secret teachings. So when we find secret teachings, if you look closely at them over the years, I don't really object to them that much, for instance, in the Tibetan traditions, 
because they're just levels of development. That's all they are. Keeping you in one level to go to the next level to go to the next level is a method of teaching. I don't particularly agree with it because somebody can go very quickly uh, through many levels and someone else can take more time and we don't separate people so much. You'll find if you come to the larger retreats with us, there are people knocking at the door for the first time and there are people who have been there for a year or more. So this is about mantras. And um, when he was saying, I do namo tasa, uh, the, one that, the ones that I use the most are um, arahan sama sambudo vija charana sampano sugato loka vidu anuturo parisatama sarati sata deva manusanam budo bhagava. And then I do the front reverse, the double one from Burma. And the reason I did that so much because my teacher made me. <laughs> but the reason he made me do it was because it made me focus better on everything I was doing. And the, the, uh, the, re the forward and reverse one is like the second time you do that on the beads, the second time you do it, you go arahan, arahan. Arahan Samasambuddha, Samasambuddha, Arahan, Arahan Samasambuddha, Vija Charana Sampano, Vija Charana Sampano, Samasambuddha, Arahan. See what I'm doing? I'm going Arahan, Arahan, the, the, the Samasambuddha. See what's happening? So I, if I have that written out, if you want to learn to do it, I'll send it to you. It's a good exercise. And what really bums you out is Bhante can do it nine times, um, let's see, nine times, nine times a day, uh, perfectly, nine times in a row, nine times a day. When he was uh, learning, you know, in the forest, in the Burmese center, and he doesn't make any mistakes. And my brain, I've had a brain injury, and I try to do this, and I can get through it once, maybe twice, then I have to start once again. <laughs> You see, so there's all these exercises all for the same reason. Can we improve our observation? Can we improve the smoothness in our operation of our meditation? Okay. Okay. We have most people are here now. So we're going to start with this. And um, the objective, the, the lesson we were talking about um, was we did Dana, the generosity, then we did the Shila, which was the uh, generosity. And all of it's about the protecting, protection of the position of the mind for the operation, effective operation of the, um, the meditation to run properly. And then we got to um, Bhavana, and I was sitting here laughing because there's no way to put Bhavana in a capsule because from that point forward, once you have the five aggregates and you have the three kinds of feelings and you're talking about the, the Sheila and you're keeping it and you have practiced forgiveness and you have Donna going on, then you're set up to start really succeeding when you practice the meditation. So when you say bhavana, everything forward now in front of this is all bhavana. Whenever we're discussing an issue with your uh, practice in meditation, we're discussing your development to the oper operative development of the mind and then the consequential change that happens in the, in the um, uh, afterwards in the, in the uh, behavior. Okay. So this is number 140, and it's the Datu Vibhanga Sutta. It's the exposition of the elements, and you're going to hear the whole thing. Lots of times we hear part of this from Bhante. This time you're going to hear the whole thing. Before we start, how many people are, I don't know how to find out, but how many people are taking notes? Because what I did was I wrote down a list um, here of what you might want to notate if you're taking, if you're writing notes. First of all, who is Puka, Pukasati? Who is the one that's in the potter shed when we start the story? And I will tell you this very quickly. He was a prince 
and he had a kingdom of his own in the northern part of India. And in his place, it was a northern territory where they had sheep and the most priceless thing you could give someone as a gift was lamb's wool shawl. And so he had sent this lamb's wool uh, material to the king, King Pasanadi in the south and uh, further in the south. And in return, King Pasanadi sent him a gift. Now, Bhikkhubodhi does a really good job telling this story on the series that he teaches about the Majima Nikaya. It's a really nice way that he talks about it. And what Pasanadi sent him was a set of golden plates with the teaching of the Buddha. And what we're trying to find out right now is when he was in the shed and the Buddha came uh, to to um, this potter's shed, Pukusati had been traveling. He had given up his kingdom, given all his goods away to his chancellor. He had left his kingdom and taken on robes, declared himself a monk, and had traveled to the south. And he claimed to be under the teaching of the Buddha, but he had not been exposed to any monks. He didn't have his robes under the monk yet, under, under the Buddha. He just went as an ascetic, okay, away from his kingdom. And uh, so what happens here is the Buddha comes along and he knows he's there ahead of time because in the morning he sits in um, infinite space in compassion in infinite space and he looks around and he sees who's ready, who's ripe to become experience Nibbana, who's out there, and he decides what to do. So he went there to where Pukasati was, where he saw he was, and he shows up at the potter shed. And then the story goes from there. Now, the question is, what did he learn from the Buddha in one night that would put him in a potential position to become an anagami? So you need to take notes on this. And um, he's leaving his kingdom behind. He's left everything and professes the blessed one as his teacher, but he's never met him. And he knows he's going to Sawati because he's going there to find him. But the Buddha has come here to the shed. And in the end of the story, you'll understand why. So first of all, he takes you through these pieces. You will hear the six elements, if you're going to write this down, the six elements. You will hear the six bases of contact. You will hear 18 kinds of mental exploration. And you will hear the four foundations. And you will hear about the tides of conceiving. And then you will hear about how you should not you should attempt to give up the tides of conceiving, means thinking, 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 giving it up, giving it up, letting it go, and seeing what's left if you sit without thinking about anything. And you should not neglect wisdom. Now, this is one of the places where I told you wisdom was a code word. So you should not neglect wisdom. The reason you should not neglect wisdom is because this wisdom means dependent origination. And that we said was the spine of the teaching. You should not neglect that. You should perceive truth and cultivate relinquishment. And to cultivate relinquishment means you should be abandoning, abandoning and letting go and letting go and letting go. Okay. And then you should train for peace. Okay, so those are the pieces that you'll hear through the story. Let's see how far we go with this. The Datu Vibhanga Sutta, Majima Nikaya number 140, the exposition of the elements. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was wandering in the Magadan country and eventually arrived at Rajagaha, And there he went to the potter, Bhagava, and he said to him, if it is not inconvenient for you, Bhagava, I will stay one night in your workshop. 
It is not inconvenient for me, venerable sir, but there is a homeless one already staying there. If he agrees, then stay as long as you like, venerable sir. Now there was a clansman named Pukusati who had gone forth from his home life into homelessness out of faith in the Blessed One without ordination is what it means. And on that occasion, he was already staying in the potter's workshop. And then the Blessed One went to the Venerable Pukasadi, and he said to him, if it is not inconvenient for you, Bhikkhu, I will stay one night in the workshop. And the potter's workshop is large enough, friend, please do stay. Let us, uh, Venerable One, stay as long as he likes. And then the Blessed One entered the potter's workshop and prepared a spread of grass at one end, and he sat down, and folding his legs crosswise, he's setting his body erect and establishing mindfulness in front of him. Then the Blessed One spent most of uh, the night seated in meditation. And then the Blessed One, he thought, this clansman conducts himself in a way that inspires confidence. Suppose I were to question him. And so he asked the Venerable Pukusati, Under whom have you gone forth, Bhikkhu? Who is your teacher? Whose Dhamma do you profess? Friend, there is the recluse Godama, the son of the Sakyans, who went forth from the Sakyan clan. Now a good report of that blessed Godama has been spread to this effect. That blessed Gotama is accomplished. He is fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, a knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans. He's enlightened and he's blessed. I've gone forth under that blessed one. That blessed one is my teacher. I profess the Dhamma of that Blessed One. Uh, but uh, Bhikkhu, where is that Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened, now living? There is, friend, a city in the northern country named Sawati. And the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened, is now living there. But Bhikkhu, have you ever seen that Blessed One before? Would you recognize him if you saw him? No, friend, I have never seen that blessed one before, nor would I recognize him if I saw him. Hmm. And then the blessed one thought a moment. This clansman has gone forth from the home life into homelessness under me. Suppose I were to teach him the Dhamma. And so the blessed one addressed the venerable Pukusati thus. Bhikkhu, I will teach you the Dhamma. Listen, attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, Venerable Pukusati replied, and the Blessed One said this. Bhikkhu, this person consists of six elements, six bases of contact, and six kinds of mental exploration and he has four foundations. Within him, the tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage at peace. The one should not neglect wisdom and should preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment, should train for peace. This is the summary of the exposition of these six elements. Monk, this person consists of six elements, so it was said, and with reference to what was this said, there are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, 
the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element. So it was with reference to this that it was said, monk, this person consists of six elements. Monk, this person consists of six bases of contact. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, there is the eye contact and the base of ear contact, the base of nose contact, the base of tongue contact, the base of body contact, the base of mind contact. So it was with reference to this that it was said, monk, this person consists of six bases of contact. And we're talking about the construction of the being. Monk, this person consists of 18 kinds of mental exploration. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said? On seeing a form with the eye, one explores a form productive of joy. One explores, explores a form productive of grief. One explores a, productive, a form that is productive of equanimity. And on hearing a sound with the ear, an odor with the nose, or tasting a flavor with the tongue, or touching a tangible with the body, or cognizing a mind object with your mind, one explores a mind object productive of joy. One explores a mind object productive of grief. One explores a mind object productive of equanimity. And so it was with reference to this that it was said, monk, the person consists of 18 kinds of mental exploration. So in this case, what they're doing is they're taking the, um, the three points and multiplying it by the six sense doors to get your 18 kinds of mental exploration. But it's not referring to exploring the mind or exploring the the, uh, the object that came up in the mind or the object that came up from joy or the object that came up with productive of grief. What it's about is investigating how it happened. And this is the deeper meaning. This is what we miss if we stop here. We can get lost trying to grok this cup. <laughs> trying to really understand this cup I see, instead of how do I see this cup? How does it operate? How does my life experience happen? So we can't get lost in that. Next one is Bhikkhu, this person has four foundations. And so it was said, and with reference to what was this said, there are the foundation of wisdom the foundation of truth, the foundation of relinquishment, and the foundation of peace. These are not exactly the four foundations you're thinking, four foundations of uh, mindfulness. It's not the same thing. This is the foundation of wisdom and exploring how everything actually works, the foundation of truth, staying in the present time, without bringing the past or the future into it and seeing it purely for what it is. The foundation of relinquishment, understanding that everything, this whole teaching is about letting go, abandoning, relinquishing, letting go, allowing, letting it be, and waiting for Anicca to operate. It is not about anything else and the foundation of peace, the peace that comes to you when everything stops jumping in the future reference or the past reference and you start living, that's the only spot you actually become alive on the life continuum line is where you are in the present time with whatever you're doing. 
One should not neglect wisdom, should preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment, and should train for peace. So this is what should be done with them. Do not neglect understanding wisdom, preserve truth always, cultivate the relinquishment by doing it all the time in life, and train consistently towards peace. Not reacting, responding. Considering something different is fine. Put it as something new in the present time and start examining it. If you want a new idea to work, keep it in front of you without tainting it from the past, what's always been done, or without causing problems from the future. And how, Bhikkhu, does one neglect, not neglect wisdom? There are these six elements, the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element. Now this is the part about the identification of everything involving the elements that is concerned, and then the dependent origination goes even further to discuss how it all operates. But this, what you're gonna hear here, is the construct of each one of these in the elements. What bhikkhu is the earth element? Now this is where we really hear a difference between the traditional four elements taught in the Chinese uh, culture, and then we see the Buddha starts out with four when he's first teaching, and then as he advances through his development of his teaching, he goes into five, and then he goes into six. By the end of his teaching, some 45 uh, years later, he's teaching six elements consistently, okay? But the interesting part about his elements are he's teaching them in the construct of where is the world? Remember me saying that the Buddha was asked by Ananda once, Lord, where is the world? And Ananda, the Buddha says to him, Ananda, the world is from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. So then we turn around and we look at the elements and say, then if that's the world and he's gonna teach us the elements that exist in the world, how is he going to teach it? Then we begin to understand why is he teaching it this way? So listen to how he teaches this. The earth element may be either internal or external. What is the internal earth element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself <laughs> is solid, solidified, and clung to, and that is the head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bone, and bone marrow, kidneys, heart, and liver, diaphragm, spleen, and lungs, intestines, mesentery, contents of the stomach, feces or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, and clung to. This is called the internal earth element. Now both the internal earth element and the external earth element are simply earth element, which is solid. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, this, all of that, Okay, this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. So here we have an introduction to anatta. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the earth element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the earth element. And what bhikkhu is the water element? The water element may be either internal or external. What is the internal water element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is water, watery, and clung to, that is bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, urine, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is water, 
watery and clung to, this is called the internal water element. And both the internal water element and external water element are simply water element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. And when one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the water element, makes the mind dispassionate towards this water element. And what bhikkhu is the fire element? The fire element may be either internal or external. What is the internal fire element? Whatever internal belonging to oneself is fire, fiery, and clung to, and that by which one is warmed, ages, and is consumed, and that by which what is eaten, drunk, consumed, and tasted gets completely digested, and whatever else internally belonging to oneself, which is fire, fiery, and clung to, and this is called the internal fire element. Now, both the internal fire element and external fire element are simply fire element. That should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one is thus as it actually seen as, as when it is seen as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the fire element and makes the mind dispassionate toward the fire element. And this is your temperature. You take in your temperature today. This is your thermometer reading. Okay. And what bhikkhu is the air element? The air element may be either internal or external. What is the internal air element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is air, airy, and clung to. That is the upgoing winds, the downgoing winds, winds in the belly and winds in the bowels, winds that course through the limbs, in breath and out breath, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is air, airy, and clung to. And this is called the internal air element. And both the internal air element and the external air element are simply air element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus, as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the air element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the air element. And what bhikkhu is the space element? The space element may be either internal or external. What is the internal space element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is space, spatial, and clung to. That is the holes of the ears, the nostrils, the door of the mouth, that aperture where what is eaten, drunk, and consumed, and tasted gets swallowed, and where it collects, and whereby it is excreted from below, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself has space, spatial, and clung to. This is called the internal space element. And both the internal space element and external space element are simply space element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, this is mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Again, anatta. And when one sees it thus, as it actually is with proper wisdom, 
one becomes disenchanted with the space element and makes the mind dispassionate toward the space element. And then there remains only consciousness, purified and bright. What does one cognize with that consciousness? One cognizes this is pleasant. One cognizes this is painful. One cognizes this is neither painful nor pleasant. So to cognize something is to understand it. Independence on a contact to be felt as pleasant, there arises a pleasant feeling. And when one feels a pleasant feeling, one understands, I feel a pleasant feeling. One understands with the cessation of that same contact to be felt as pleasant, its corresponding feeling. The pleasant feeling that arose in dependence on the contact to be felt as pleasant ceases and subsides. Independence on the contact to be felt as painful, there arises a painful feeling. When one feels a painful feeling, you understand, I feel a painful feeling. And when one understands with the cessation of that same contact to be felt as painful, it's corresponding feeling, the painful feeling that arose in dependence on that contact to be felt as painful. It ceases and subsides. So the contact ceases as the feeling occurs. And the feeling will cease when the doorbell rings. <laughs> Just a second. It's a good, it's a good thing we can edit. <laughs> okay. Let's see where I was. Okay. What I was trying to point out to you. Independence on a contact to be felt. Uh, and the, when you have feeling occurs and it registers, the contact is gone. So when feeling is occurring, the moment craving happens, which is happening from atta, I like or I don't like something, mind. And when that occurs, then the feeling is gone. When you move from the craving, the I don't like it statement, the moment you go into the story of clinging, the upadana, the moment that occurs, you have left the contact. It's not there anymore. The moment you move from the story about why you don't like something in the clinging, which is making this holding, grasping feeling stronger, you dive into your library in your head. We call it your habitual tendency library. It's different with each one of you based on how you grew up, how you react and you choose a card and you pull out the card and I'm gonna do this now. And then you give birth to the reaction if you don't have a trained mind. If you have a trained mind, you might realize that when you hear a particular thing in a relationship or when you see a particular sight, you always react the same way. And if you realize that and take note of it, you decide to let your library go. Still, when you do see something and you don't like it and the story runs, oh, you realize, hmm, every time this happens in life, I react, I, I 
I start this story, mental proliferation in my mind again. I'm not going to do that anymore. You can say that. Then you have craving left. And craving after the feeling, that craving, I don't like it. You realize maybe you're taking things too personally. And that's a tightened feeling. I'll try not to do that, you say to yourself. I'll let you in on a secret. Only the arahat stops completely. <laughs> but you slow down with getting involved in the story, the concepts and story and imagination and even memories and everything of how whatever it is is happening is just like it something else. So you might think you're living in the present time, but actually you're not there yet if this is still happening. The most irritating one is he left me <laughs> or she left me. And then you're caught with everyone you meet is this one like the other one is what's happening in relationships and the difficulty of only having a present new experience and that's all. There was a picture, a friend of mine, um, we both met each other, we were good friends. We never had a relationship, but we were good friends. Someone left me long ago and someone left him the same month his apartment was next to where mine was and we were on two porches with a wall in between. I went out there to sit down and eat ice cream and cry and I kept hearing an echo around the wall and I finally realized someone else was sitting there slurping up something and, I, and then we met, he got curious like who was there and we met each other on a basic terms and just lamented for two weeks over what had happened and the comparison of what had happened. And it was interesting. We, he sent a card to me and it was priceless card. It was a picture of two people walking on a sidewalk uh, towards each other. And each person was pushing a shopping cart. They were pushing a shopping cart down the, sidewalk in the city towards each other and suddenly they lifted their head up and they looked at each other and all kinds of things exploded in the air and it was love at first sight and then they left the shopping carts and went in and had coffee together and came out and forgot the shopping carts and then they had this relationship, but they forgot they had to go back and get the shopping carts. And what was in the shopping carts? Mm. All of those other relationships in the shopping cart, all those other experiences. And then they had to go through the bumps of trying to have an individual relationship without what was in the wagon from before. We do this, we do this. Human beings do this all the time. We have a tough time with understanding the truth of the past. It's really truly past. And that means the energy in the event is over. We cannot recolor the event. Unfortunately, we cannot mold it again. We cannot make it happen again. It's fixed in time. Understanding that, then the only place we have is right here where we can be here now. And that's what we need to try to practice. And nobody expects you to go out and do this right away. You go out and you practice because what did the Buddha say about his teachings? He told us in the Anguttara Nikaya, in the Book of Threes, around section 125, I do not teach a Dhamma without a basis. 
I do not teach a Dhamma without knowledge, and I do not teach a Dhamma without an antidote. I teach a Dhamma with a basis. I teach one with knowledge and with an antidote. So he found the escape. But it isn't just the end Nibbana escape. It's a gradual teaching, a gradual practice, and a gradual progress. Okay. In dependence on the contact to be felt as painful, there arises the painful feeling. When one is, feels the painful feeling, one understands, I feel the painful feeling. One understands with the cessation of that, that contact to be felt as painful, its corresponding feeling arises, the painful feeling that arose in dependence on the contact to be felt as painful ceases and subsides. So no one of the links has any part in the link that comes up after it. You have to digest that for a little while. But that's what this is saying. Professor Karuna Dasa, University of Hong Kong, in his foundation book on Buddhism, he writes a chapter about this in explaining dependent origination. He explains not one of these links have anything to do with any part of these links. This is what this sutta is explaining. Independence on the contact to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant, there arises a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. And when one feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, one understands, I feel a neither pleasant nor painful feeling. One understands with the cessation of that same contact to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant, its corresponding feeling, the neither painful nor pleasant feeling that arose in dependence on that contact to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant will cease and subside. Bhikkhu, just as, just as from the contact and friction of two fire sticks, that the heat is generated and fire is produced. And with the separation and disjunction of the two fire sticks, the corresponding heat ceases and subsides. So too, he explains this all again with the contact for the pleasant, for the painful, and neither painful or pleasant, he repeats it again. And then there remains only equanimity, purified and bright, malleable, wieldy and radiant. Suppose Bhikkhu, a skilled goldsmith, or his apprentice were to prepare a furnace, heat up the crucible, take some gold with tongs and put it into the crucible. From time to time, he would blow on it. From time to time, he would sprinkle water over it. And from time to time, he would just look on and the gold would become refined, well refined, completely refined, faultless, rid of dross, malleable, wieldy, and radiant. And then whatever kind of ornament he wishes to make from it, whether a golden chain or earrings or a necklace, a golden garland, it would serve his purpose. So to Bhikkhu, then there remains only equanimity. It is purified and bright. It is malleable, wieldy, and radiant. When things try to disturb you when you're in equanimity, you remember the laws that are regarding the hindrance, the knowledge that you have about it, and you stay with the equanimity and keep just seeing what happens next as you're in there. That's what this point's talking about. He understands thus, if I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of infinite space and develop my mind accordingly, then equanimity of mind supported at, by that base, clinging to it would remain for a very long time. 
and I were to direct this equanimity, so purified and bright to the base of infinite consciousness or to the base of nothingness or to the base of neither perception or non-perception and to develop mind accordingly in balance, then this equanimity of mind supported by that base clinging to it would remain for a very long time. Why? Because of your interest and your curiosity of that level of that ability to watch. He understands thus, if I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of infinite space and develop my mind accordingly, this would be conditioned. And conditioned means what? It means, although it's happening, it will always pass away. I've uh, had some interesting experiences over the years of someone saying, I sat in, in the fourth jhana. I have the fourth jhana. I don't need to discuss this with you. And I sort of wondered about that. Well, every time you sit, it's different. So how can you think that if you sat in it one time, what you do put it in your pocket and you have it in there, you can just take it out again? <laughs> no, no. All the states that you experience are conditional. Even the experience of Nibbana arises and has a, a passing away until you get to the arahatship and fruition. At that point, the stability stays with you, but it's the result of the experience of the Nibbana that stays with you much, much longer and permanently if it's the super mundane. If I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the infinite consciousness or nothingness or neither perception or non-perception, it would be conditioned. He does not form any condition or generate any volition tending towards either being or non-being. So this, he does not form any condition, meaning where he is generating his will towards getting someplace. Once again, it's saying, don't do anything, just wait and watch. The game, if you want the description of the game, if we have to put a game name on the box, we could say this is the experience. This is an experience of experiencing no experience. <laughs> so can you experience the experience of no experience? And just watch and see what happens. That's what gets interesting. Since he does not form any condition to generate any volition tending towards either being or non-being, he does not cling to anything in this world. Now we're talking arahat level. When he does not cling, he is not, well, this is, is uh, uh, what do you say, uh, progressional. Listen to this part. He does not cling, he is not agitated. When he is not agitated, he personally attains Nibbana. So they're talking about the deepest levels and so in the deepest levels, when I'm saying just sit there, just watch and see what happens when nothing is going on in your mind. He does not cling to anything in the world. He does, when he does not cling, he is not agitated, meaning nothing is disturbing him. And when he is not agitated, he personally attains the condition necessary for the Nibbana. He understands then birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, there is no more coming to any state of being. And we make jokes about this sometimes because we say, you know, the way we figured out how this works, the eighth time that you experience Nibbana, this is what happens. So what do I mean? Because we're seeing this opening experience of the Nibbana occurring, but there is a mundane Nibbana experience at the level that is pre sotapanna And you have sotapanna, sotapanna fruition, sakadagami, sakadagami, and, from his, uh, and um, fruition. You have anagami, anagami fruition, you have arahat, and you have arahat and fruition. Now, it's interesting, I've told you, uh, talked to you before about how things change over time. So some people will say, yes, but you see the fruition happens. The moment you're an arahat, there's the fruition. 
that's one theory, but they never seem to be able to explain to me who's in the camp then. And what do I mean? <laughs> because in the camp is the description of eight kinds of individuals, and they're working in eight groups of development under Sariputta and Moggallana to reach the super mundane. So if you tell me <laughs> that the fruition is happening like that after you have one of these nibbanic experiences, that can't be because there'd only be four groups walking around. And this is in more than one place we see the eight kinds of people in the camp. And this is where we hear also about whole descriptions in suttas explaining this group who is not sewed upon yet is all talking together. I love this part. They're all talking together about what's happening in their meditation as they're trying to become sewed upon. And the next group, once they're sewed upon it, they move over here and they're all talking about it to become sewed upon it and fruition. And you have eight, those, those eight groups going on, you see? You have to eliminate an awful lot of suttas if you decide that fruition just comes with a bang after the Nibbana comes and then there's fruition. So it doesn't play out beside the suttas. It is, it, if he feels pleasant feeling, he understands it is impermanent. There is no holding to it. There is no delight in it. So now he's gonna go into a lesson on a Nietzsche with this, uh, this monk. If he feels painful feeling, he understands it's impermanent. There's no holding on to it. There's no delight in it. If he feels neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands it's impermanent. No holding on to it, no delight in it. If he feels a pleasant feeling, he feels it detached. If he feels a pleasant, painful feeling, he feels it detached. If he feels a neither pleasant nor painful feeling, he feels it detached. There's a statement that the Buddha was feeling pleasant, painful, and neutral feelings, right there. He just took you through with the birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, there is no more coming to any state of being. That's the arahat with fruition, period. Super mundane Nibbana. Now he's saying this. So he's talking about the condition of the Buddha after he became awakened as an arahat with fruition. When he feels a feeling terminating with the body, he understands, I feel a feeling terminating with the body. When he feels a feeling terminating with life, he understands, I feel a feeling terminating with life. Now you go back to 143. Now you reread the teaching that Sariputta gave to Nathapindika as he was dying. And you'll see the relationship between this and what um, is being taught to Anathapindika as he's dying. He understands on the dissolution of the body with the ending of life, all that is felt not being delighted in will become cool right here. And just as an oil lamp burns in dependence on oil and a wick, when the oil and the wick are used up if it does not get any more fuel, it is extinguished from lack of fuel. So too, when he feels a feeling terminating with the body, a feeling terminating with life, he understands that I feel the feeling terminating with my life. And he understands on the dissolution of the body with the ending of life, all that is left, not being delighted in, will become cool, right there. And therefore, a monk possessing this wisdom, and what's he, uh, what does he uh, possess right there? A whole complete integrated and completely precise knowledge of the process, impersonal process and dependent origination. Possesses the supreme foundation of wisdom. For this, Bhikkhu is a supreme noble wisdom, namely the knowledge of the destruction of all of the suffering. His deliverance being found upon truth is unshakable for, for that is false monk, which has a deceptive nature. And that is true, which has an undeceptive nature, Nibbana. Therefore a monk possessing this truth 
possesses the supreme foundation of truth. For this monk is the supreme noble truth, namely Nibbana, which has an undeceptive nature. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he undertook and accepted acquisitions, but now he has abandoned them and cut them off at the root. He made them like a palm stump, done away with them, so that they are no longer subject to future arising. I had to go out and find a palm stump in Sri Lanka. I didn't understand what it meant, but if you see, you know, sometimes trees that get damaged in a storm, they can grow again. But if you go out after hurricane in Florida and you look at a palm tree stump, it's not coming back. It doesn't happen because of the construction of the tree. Therefore, a monk possessing this relinquishment, this letting go, possesses the supreme foundation of relinquishment. And for this monk is the supreme noble relinquishment, namely the relinquishing of all acquisitions. And acquisitions here is acquiring the interest, involvement, mental proliferation, and everything that goes with it. That's what this acquisition is. And there's nothing there anymore. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced covetousness, desire, and lust. But now he has abandoned them, cut off them at the root, and made them like a palm stump. He's done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. And formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced anger, ill will, and hate. But now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, and made them like a palm stump and done away with them so that they are no longer subject to any future arising. And formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced ignorance and delusion. The delusion is what? The delusion is believing all of it is me, it is mine, it is myself. Delusion is atta. Now he has abandoned this and cut it off at the root and made it like a palm stump and done away with it so that there is no longer any subject future to arising. And therefore the monk possessing this peace, this is the peace. This is the ultimate peace. Possesses the supreme foundation of peace. For this monk is the supreme noble peace, namely the pacification of lust, hate, and delusion. And so it was with reference to this that it was said one should not neglect wisdom, one should preserve truth, one should cultivate relinquishment, and should train for peace. And the tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage at peace. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, monk, I am is a conceiving. So he's telling you right now that Atta is this conceiving he's talking about. I am this is conceiving. I shall be is conceiving. I shall not be is a conceiving. I shall be possessed of form is a conceiving. I shall be formless is a conceiving. I shall be percipient is a conceiving. I shall be non-percipient is a conceiving. I shall be neither percipient nor non-percipient in conceiving. Conceiving is a disease. Conceiving is a tumor. Conceiving is a dart. By overturning all the conceiving monk, one is called the sage at peace. And the sage at peace is not born, does not age, does not die. He is not shaken and does not yearn. For there is nothing present in him by which he might be born. Not being born, how could he age? Not aging, how could he die? not dying, how could he be shaken? Not being shaken, 
Why would he yearn? And so it was with reference to this that it was said, the tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage of peace. Monk, bear in mind this brief exposition of these six elements. We always like it when they say it's brief. <laughs> But thereupon the venerable Pukusati thought, indeed, the teacher has come to me. The sublime one has come to me. The fully enlightened one has come here to me. And then he rose from his seat, arranged his upper robe over one shoulder, and he prostrated himself with his head at the blessed one's feet. And he said, venerable sir, a transgression overcame me, in that like a fool, confused and blundering, I presumed to address the Blessed One as friend. Venerable sir, may the Blessed One forgive my transgression and see it as such for the sake of restraint in the future. Surely, monk, a transgression overcame you in that like a fool, confused and blundering, you presumed to address me as friend. But since you see your transgression as such and you make amends in accordance with the Dhamma, we forgive you. For it is growth in the noble one's discipline when one sees a transgression as such that he makes amends in accordance with the Dhamma and undertakes restraint in the future. This isn't just for monks, it's for all of us. So when we make a mistake, we need to recite it to ourselves or tell it to a trusted friend and get it out and dismiss it from our mind and not carry it inside because that is important that the mind is clear and purified as we keep working. Venerable sir, I would receive the full admission under the blessed one he asks to be ordained. But are your bowl and robes complete, monk? Venerable sir, my bowl and robes are not complete. Bhikkhu Tathagatas do not give the full admission to anyone whose bowl and robes are not complete. When you come to the teacher, you must have your, bowls and ro your bowl and robes. Or if you're coming to, do, uh, to train and then we can help you to get them. And this is what happens here. Then the Venerable Pukasati, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's words, he rose from his seat and after paying homage to the Blessed One, keeping him on his right, he departed in order to search for a bowl and robes. Then, while the Venerable Pukasati was searching for his bowl in the village and robes, for his bowl and robes in the village, a stray cow killed him. <sighs> We always sit and listen to this, and there's always somebody, a lot of times me, with tears running down my eyes, you know, because this, he's, he found his Buddha, he found his teacher. It was his teacher ends up where he is, teaches him everything he needs to know, and he knew, this is what I was telling you in the beginning, you would find out at the end. The reason, why did he go, all the people he saw that morning who needed him to teach, why did he go to this man. Why? Because he knew what was going to happen. And so he knew he was there. He knew he would perceive it. He knew he would understand it and ask for ordination. He knew he would leave. And he knew that a stray cow would kill him. Then a number of monks, of bhikkhus, went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told him, Venerable Sir, the clansman Pukasati, who was given brief instruction by the Blessed One, he has died. What is his destination? What is his course? Monks, the clansman Pukasati was wise. He practiced in accordance with the Dhamma. He did not trouble me in the interpretation of the Dhamma. With the destruction of the five lower fetters, the clansman Pukasati has reappeared spontaneously in the pure abodes 
and will attain his final Nibbana there without ever returning from that world. And that means that he became an anagami. So this is why it's fun to, to put together the, in a capsule the teachings to see how much does it take if the person really gives ear and really practices in earnest and really takes it and runs with it. How long does it take them? This is what the Blessed One said, and the bhikkhus were satisfied, and they were delighted in the Blessed One's words. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So do you have any questions about this? Any questions about what happened in the story? Does anybody have any questions? Somebody must have a question. Sister, I have a question. Actually, there is a, uh, this is a question that I got a long time ago. Mm -hmm. It's about, uh, so the Venerable Bukusati actually died from being hit by the bull or a cow, right? Okay. Yeah, but cow. they say that when you are an Arya, then you're not supposed to die in a tragic way. So why did it happen? How can it be possible? The Arahat cannot. You won't die. The Arahat won't die. I never heard it with the other three. No, but... Three. Hmm? I, but I never Mahamogalana died. Mahamogalana also died in a tragic way. It's true. Well, yeah, but Mogalana's kind of we Mogalana's story is a little bit different because um, Mogalana's situation is he knew for a long time this was going to happen, and the Buddha also knew it. And um, let me see something, just a second about that. Ardhika. You know, Mogalana yes, was you have to understand about you have to understand about Mogalana was carrying a patricide and matricide. He was carrying that karma. In another lifetime he killed his mother and his father. So I mean the whole story is amazing. I'm trying to see if it's here. Go ahead, uh, uh, um, doctor, go ahead for a second while I find this. Go ahead. Has Buddha ever himself said that uh, Arhans will not die in a tragic way? I don't think so. Has Buddha himself said this? Well, where it goes with um, the with the parani, I'm sorry, wait a minute. With the Brahma, Brahma Viharas, they say that you won't die in the Brahma Viharas. If you go through the Brahma Viharas to your attainments, you won't die a violent death. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I have to fish around and find this for you and probably come back with it yeah. again. Let me see if there's an insect back here. I want to I wanna find Mogulana because I know there was something in this one. Hoo -hoo, something, my goodness, there's a lot. <laughs> 2014 or two. Let's try that. 227. Let's try that. Um, no. The whole story of Sariputta and Mogulana are just, it's absolutely amazing how they started out as two friends and go off to search for the answers and then how they separated and agreed to come back together when they found the answer and let the other one know. And then they come back to the same place and they end up with the Buddha. It's a remarkable story. And, um, and then Sariputta, he becomes the mother. I mean, is that right? Yeah, Sariputta is the mother, and um, Mogalana is the nurse, okay? And when you're the mother, you have to take care of the teaching at the front door, and you teach the monks to get everything they need, and, and you teach them the basic meditation in the very beginning, and you teach them the uh, forgiveness and the, the um, generosity and the shila, and have them learn about how to live in the camp and live amongst the other monks, everything, all the manners, all that stuff. And then you start them out until you get them to the fourth jhana. When they get to the 
fourth jhana, before they do the mental states, when they start the mental states, they're turned over to Moggallana. Moggallana is the nurse. By the time you get to the fourth jhana, we're sort of, uh, our interviews are pretty quick with you and um, we've got it down to a system. And then you're on your own most of the time, like the nurse just stops in to check and make sure you're taking your medicine. Well, Moggallana checks in with you once in a while, or you go to him if you have a question about proceeding down through infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception or non-perception. And you're, you're working with the Moggallana mostly in the frustrating one at the end of neither perception or non-perception, trying to get in the end. And probably uh, you come back and bother the, bother the guides a bit when you're in nothingness because it's kind of irritating if you've been somebody where there's always been something there <laughs> and you have to come back and say, but why is nothing happening? So that's the way these two end up. And, and he ends up, they end up as the two people who are running the school, basically. In other words, it's like the Buddha is the head of the school and it's in a gypsy wagon and it moves all around India. This is just my own story. <laughs> you know? And it moves around, you see where it goes and how it travels and people travel to where they are and they study with them and go away. But then they come and they follow the camp and they move around also, yeah? Did you have something, Bhante, too? Yeah? Hmm? Okay. So I'm trying to find where it is that Moggallana, he, the way the story went, I know this, um, that when Moggallana dies, he, he comes and he tells, he tells uh, the Buddha, it's time for him to die because they're, they're, they've come. And these are the descendants who are coming to, to, for the fruition of the karma of him killing his mother and father. That's what's going to happen. And he says he's going to the, um, uh, where'd he go, Bonte? He went to the Vul Vulcan, no, Vulture's Peak, right? He was at I Vulture's don't Peak. remember that uh, exactly. But I was just uh, trying to say this. Uh, there is a short answer for this. One is that there is a karmic reason for a person to have a end. And uh, 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 one place where it is said that uh, you don't die of an accident is when you're doing Brahma Viharas. So when you're yeah. doing Brahma Viharas, uh, you are not uh, dying uh, in an uh, accident. And uh, uh, we can see that uh, there is one uh, place where Buddha is said to be, uh, 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 means he, he, Buddha cannot die. Uh, uh, from an accident or from uh, being harmed. Uh, that, is, that is the maximum uh, a Buddha can be injured but cannot be killed. That has been mentioned in suttas also. It's that, not a violent death. It's, it can't be a violent death. right? Uh, for, a, for an Arahant, that has not been mentioned in the suttas. But in uh, Brahma Viharas, if you're doing, he will not die uh, of an accident. Yeah. Then you so, won't die by fire or like a big crash. Murder. Like, Especially murder. murder. Yeah, and you know, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you no, why. I am not sure if, if uh, murder is an accident. Mm -hmm. uh, so <laughs> that I'm not sure about. Well, <laughs> if I say to you, you can't die in a car crash, and you know, our dick <laughs> takes, the, takes the screws out of the wheels on my car, and then I have a big car crash. I mean, I didn't plan to have a violent death, but he no, and he did. That didn't. is not an accident. No, you did not have an accident. You had uh, a planned way. The car was the weapon, was used as a weapon. So that uh, just using a car does not make it an accident. So that is mm. something I, I, that would be my perspective on that. I think mm. it's pretty bad if he has the lug nuts in his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I just read in a in a thesis that Bhukku Sati died because uh, the cow was a curtesan in a past life and Bhukku Sati had ki uh, killed her in past life. So he died like that. Kar karmic reason, that is all. Yeah, he yeah. was cruel. To, probably somebody who was cruel to the, to the cows. You know, I, I like to go to the, I, I like this very much. There's a, in, in, in um, Ulastagar, there's a big temple that is a, a Sikh temple that takes care of cows and, and bulls um, that don't have homes. And there's over, um, there's over 4,000 uh, cows there in a real organized uh, setup with veterinarians and everything. And you can go there in the morning and it takes like half an hour for you to go there and feed the cows and then come, come back home. 
to wherever you're staying. So I'm really happy about going back there. But these cows, when they come, they've been ill-treated and people throw them away if they can't pull the cart anymore and leave them on the side of the road to die and somebody will you know, report them. Or the cow gets pregnant and the man doesn't want to take care of her when they're pregnant, so she'll, they'll just, just abandon them and somebody will report them and they go get them. It's an amazing place. It's absolutely amazing. The cow becomes really sacred because not only um, the cow is, you know, uh, providing you uh, the food um, as far as the milk is concerned, providing you the milk, but it's also providing you in this environment, in this climate, it's providing you uh, the droppings and it becomes the manure for the fields and often the seeds, uh, depending on how the cow is taken care of and what it's fed, what it regrows. It's amazing. All the stories that go in that, in that direction about the cow is really something. But I grew up around a dairy farm and uh, you know, I used to help the cows give birth to their babies and things like that. So just walking in the place takes me back to being eight years old, just from the smell of this green grass and manure and cows all around me. <laughs> but anyway, this happened to Mogulana, where he had his, his death is amazingly violent. And it reminds me of the Christian stories of the apostles and how they died one by one. And, and uh, this was equally violent because of the, of the end of this karma that he goes through. He uh, goes up to the mountain where he knows these men are, are there, but he doesn't know where they're coming from. They capture him, they beat him up, they put him in a sack and they beat him so hard. There's, there was an account where he doesn't have any bones left at all in the bag. Um, except for the size of toothpicks. This is how badly he gets beaten to a pulp and, un, and it's just gone. And then he comes after his uh, body's gone, he comes to the Buddha and, and you know, bows to him and says something. Which is sutta is that in? You remember where that is, Bhante? I remember. I don't remember the suttas, but uh, it, this, his story is there in the uh, Terakata uh, where uh, 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 the story of Moglana is there. And, uh, it, could have been there. Yeah, it could have been there. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, <coughs> I have a question. Well, oh, okay. Let me do one. Let me do one more thing with um, Ardika about this. The reason that you would not have a violent death if you are doing the Brahma Viharas is not true with the breathing meditator. Why isn't it true with the breathing meditator? Well, this is my argument about why do they get there faster and go down the path more easily if they're using the Brahma Viharas. And we're going to talk about this later, but the real secret is because you're using the Brahma Viharas, they're designed to be used all the time as you're developing them in your mind, in your brain. All the time in life, it's not something for just sitting. I don't care if you're developing at home, the temple or retreat. It's not for that. It's for the whole of life. So the faster you start to use the Brahma Vihara steps of either loving kindness, compassion, or joy, or equanimity during the daytime in everything you're doing, you're protecting yourself. And the, the bad, unwholesome thoughts cannot arise as long as the brain is operating on those, on those topics. See? Yes, sir. I had Marco over here. Yep. Hi. Um, in the Sutta, uh, when it talks about the 18 kind of men mental explorations, yeah. um, it's exploring a sense object productive of joy, of grief, and of equanimity. So what would be a sense object productive of equanimity? Say it again. What would what? What would? Um, um, uh, exploring a sense object productive of equanimity. Like oh, it says, yeah. it says okay. in the sutta. Well, that's easy. Okay. You go, go to, um, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> go to, um, <laughs> um, 62, you go to 62, section 18. And when you, when you, if you memorize these, you always remember these. Okay. And you get the answer to this question. But you develop meditation on when you're working with loving kindness, no ill will can come up. And your investigation of yeah. that, 
do you have an experience yes. of ill will when you're practicing loving kindness? When you're practicing med develop meditation on compassion, when you develop the meditation on compassion, no thoughts of cruelty, they're, they're abandoned. And when you are developing uh, meditation on the joy, um, then discontent cannot be coming up at all. This is one of the reasons if you're walking around with a purified mind all the time, it doesn't matter what happens. People come up to you and they're, they're looking like they're going to be violent and you start smiling at them and you're just radiating this energy. And if you have one, give them a candy bar. <laughs> you know, they're from people doing it. I've actually had people come up and I'll tell you about a story about Bonte. Okay. Um, it's this is my best. This is the best one, really. He had two situations, like this one was in Hawaii and one was in New York City. The one in Hawaii had to do with teenagers, but the one in New York City was far more serious. He was in an area where he was um, staying uh, with a group of monks and decided to take a walk by himself. Now, he was on the edge of a good neighborhood. That's where they built this place. So if he went one block the wrong direction, he could be in a very bad almost like empty warehouse district in a bad part of New York City. So he's taking this walk and he has his, you know, we have our bag on our shoulder and he has his bag on his shoulder and he's walking down the street just casually and there's nobody on the street. And I'm thinking to myself from my own growing up in Philadelphia, you don't go in city streets where nobody else is walking. That's a cardinal lesson. Unless you, if you realize, you look at the area and you see it's deserted, you just don't walk around by yourself. And so he's walking around, but he's always running his, you know, Brahma Viharas always are turned on. It's like turned on constantly, you know, and he has this, this capsule he walks around in. And there was a car that came creeping up behind him slowly on the road. There were no other vehicles around. And, and then it was one of these old cars with the big wings on the back. And uh, he, they stopped the car and a guy gets out and he walks up from behind. So Bonte realizes he's behind him. He turns around and, and he, uh, the guy, he says, hello. And the guy kind of stops and he's looking, Bonte's looking at his hands and his hands are wrapped up in bandages, you see? wrapped up around the wrist and the entire hand is wrapped up in bandages like this okay and so he think he just looks at the man and he, he gets a very sincerely in his voice he says to him you've injured your hand can i see it i'm a healer i can help you that's all he says to him the man hasn't said anything and the man he steps back and looks at him and uh and kind of paused, he said, and then he turned around, went back, got in the car, and they drove away. They drove past him sort of fast and drove away. And I said, well, what was that? And he said, well, see, I didn't get it either until I ran it through my head, he said, and his hand was wrapped up over brass knuckles. He had brass knuckles or metal knuckles you put on your fist. You wrap them up with a bandage because you're gonna beat somebody up and he said he was going to mug him. And why didn't he get mugged? Why? It was a, a perfect arrangement for them to take his bag and walk away with it, which is funny because there wouldn't have been any money in it. it. Would have been a passport, but no money, <laughs> you know? And, and this is what was protecting him was this constant walking. And when we went to, when we went to Japan the first time, I said, this is too much for me. And he said, this is, this is what I want you to do. The, the whole entire time you're here, I just want you, because I, I almost said tears in my eyes. It was just too much to take. Limousines, kings, queens, emperors, all this crap. <laughs> I couldn't handle it. <laughs> you know, and, you know, and he said, just keep smiling and just keep emanating meta the whole time for the whole week that you're there. I can do that. I can do that. Just do that. And nothing, you, nothing disturbed me anymore after that. Quite a lot of reasons to get disturbed, but there was no reason to get there. So this is a protection system. And what I'm showing you is what's it worth? Well, it's worth a lot because it, when you start to discover 
uh, that fear is not there anymore. Now, this is not a absence of, um, what do you call it, fight or flight? You know, it's not an absence of that. It's different. Where you would usually, everybody would get scared in a situation, you just don't. And you know what to do, and you can help other people immediately. And um, my life just wasn't like that before. I mean, if you're in an accident and I pass your car, I can get out and help you get out of the car and get somebody to come and help you and stay with you and then leave when they get there, just like that. Nothing disturbs me to do that. Why does this happen? Just because you're in, a, you're in a framework of something has to be done, you know what to do, it isn't like anything else. You just do it, you take care of it, and then you go on. And it's no big deal. But these are things that you have to be able to slowly experience. And what they're talking about here is experiencing what is happening in those types of situations, experience how they operate and experience what doesn't happen anymore gradually in the training. Get it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what, that's what yeah. that's talking about. Okay? Yeah. Anybody yeah. else? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Anybody else? Mr. Yeah. Okay, now I have a quick question. So um, in this sutta, um, we looked at each of the elements, um, like the earth element, water element, and all that. And then the Buddha said, okay, and that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom, but this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And I was curious comparing that with the Chachaka Sutta where the um, section on the cessation of identity and we will look at, you know, the I and this is not me. This. So I'm just wondering, is this just, is this just another way of training the mind and that we can... Um, choose which one we want to use or no yeah. <laughs> this is a sign it's like this um, it's like a yellow sign like this in the moment you you see this is not me this is not mine this is not myself it's like this is the anatta teaching section of this sutta it's written right there anatta teaching when i went through the sutta earlier today um let me show you what i did so if you have your books, you can do it. Um, you can do it the same spots. But I went through it, see if I could pinpoint a few things. I'm always telling you. And if you go, what's interesting about it is on, we'll go a piece at a time in 140 at section 21, this is where they start going right into uh, showing you that he's, he's talking about the path in the, the mental training, mental, mental jhana training, infinite space, infinite consciousness, okay? Then at 22, he does infinite consciousness, nothing in neither perception or non-perception. 21 is infinite space, okay? The next spot is if you go to... Um, in 22, he touches on the Nibbana. He's talking about that this, this is de demonstrating the Arahat reaching the super mundane, uh, having the experience of birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, there is no more coming to any state of being. This is interesting um, because he's coming to Anagami level but each time you experience a piece of this, every time you have an attainment, at whatever level you're at, you experience. This is reducing, reducing out. In 23, he starts teaching Anicca. He starts teaching it. And this is Anicca is interesting because we know it's one of the three characteristics, Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, okay. And we also know, we call, I call Anicca the, the, um, the spark, uh, is the um, atta, atta, Anicca is the cause of the suffering, the discontentment with the change. Anicca is the constant, persistent change always happening. No way around it. Universal law, law of nature, everything changes. And you can hunt for it for days like I did, like a fool driving from Maine down to Florida. 
And at the end of the drive, the only thing I could figure out was there was only one thing permanent in the whole universe. And that was the existence of impermanence. <laughs> That's it. It's absolute and unchangeable throughout the whole, the whole celestial system. So Anicca is real important to see that it's, it's causing the suffering, okay? And the Atta is what triggers the craving in the suffering. Atta does. So if you want to fool around with trying um, to say, this is me, this is mine, this is myself, you're fooling around with, let's see how it is with Atta, Atta, and Atta. <laughs> And then this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. Then you're playing with, what's it like if I walk around all day and I realize that none, none of this is me or mine or myself. It's process occurring. In fact, everything I see, well, that's taking you too far, but um, <laughs> everything you see, it isn't there. <laughs> it's all from your mind projecting that it's there. See? And, and the problem with the, the suffering is we come up amongst all these people on the earth who have never heard any of this around us. And these people are um, diving into to me and my and mine self. And I, I like, I don't like. And these I like, I don't like it mine. It's polite to say it that way. But what happens is I like it, I want it, attachment or I don't like it, I don't want it, aversion, then when we say aversion, you immediately in another circle, another event, get attached to wanting that to stop. So it's attached, when aversion hits, it throws you into a very serious uh, attachment. Do you understand? Does everybody get that? The moment that you experience aversion, and you say, I don't like this. You go to, I've got to stop this. And then you become hooked into, attached to that. And it's very serious. It's very strong, All right. Then he took you down through the fruition. And then on the next page, um, in four, well, page uh, one, oh, I'm sorry, page um, 246, okay. He's very neat and clean how he takes you through each one of these and makes a point of you understanding. He keeps re-emphasizing, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. In any place you see that happening, that's an anatta teaching. Yeah? That's it. And then he does the atta uh, explanation of of what's wrong in 31, he shows you what's, this, he's 29 is the summary of the teaching. He groups it together. He says, the tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations which I have taught you. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over you, you are called a sage at peace. So he's telling you, when all of the um, mental proliferation and personal, all that stuff stops, all opinion completely leaves. And for those who really want to be strong about their opinion, and a lot of men and women are like this and want to control things very tightly in their world, my suggestion is to start playing games. Just pretend it's a game and play what if. Don't say, I have to be like this. Try going for one week and saying, what if it's different here than it is here? In, in 19, he's telling you in the very beginning, before we always go back to this one, he's telling you in, in, uh, before, he, um, before he starts anything, he says to them, monks, before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, it occurred to me, suppose that I divide my thoughts in two classes. Now, this is the basis for his whole entire quest and experiment. I will set on one side thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of cruelty. I will set on the other side thoughts of renunciation, which means an impersonal, completely impersonal experiment with non-ill will and non-cruelty. And non-ill will is 
loving kindness, non-cruelty is compassion, okay? So he has two sides. Then he basically, in the story here, he, he um, experiments for like a period of time living in one side, we suspect without precepts, and the other side with precepts, and he tests the water. And then he decides, hey, wait a minute. I mean, it's a lot nicer and easier to live life if I'm keeping the precepts and living over here with loving kindness and with um, uh, compassion and with joy and equanimity. It's a lot nicer and I'm doing anatta instead of atta. And he tested for himself. And that's what he's trying to teach his monks. When he's teaching them, this is the primary change in the way he teaches. The guru says, this is what you do. This is how it is. Okay, next person. But he says, did you see it? Do you know it? Have you had direct knowledge? His approach is totally against the grain of what was going on in India at the time. And even today, when, when I went to New York and I, I met a bunch of young um, people who were studying uh, the Vedas and Upanishads and asked them, how are they studying? How are they taught the scriptures? You know, they're telling me, these teenagers, a direct um, duplicate statement to what's preserved in the text in 95 in the description of how it's taught. And you will say it this way and memorize it this way and repeat it this way. You can't stop them and say, why? No, 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 no questions. <laughs> You have to just learn to repeat and echo everything the way it's been done by you, your, your father, your grandfather, great grandfather, and so forth for generations. And the Buddha just really changed the whole structure of teacher student relationship. It was amazing what he did. And then he um, also looks at women eventually and says, well, why somebody says to him, why should you bring these women in? Well, because they can understand <laughs> when the monk said that and when Bhatti said that, of course, I'll, I'll tell you something. He had to say that because I had the keys to the car, <laughs> the keys to the truck, and we were in Florida. If he didn't say that, I might just leave. <laughs> no, but no, he was being honest. He was just saying, because she can understand, I taught her this, and he taught me from the beginning, and I had to scratch out on my, so he wasn't teaching like we teach today. He was you have to go and you have to write them down in English and learn them all in English. And then when we drive a few hundred, you know, 20, 30,000 miles, then, then while we're driving, you can uh, learn them in Pali and then recite them in Pali. Now let's learn a suit and now let's learn this in English, 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 and then let's learn it in Pali, the pieces. I'm not good at Pali, but I can get my way around. And what I want my students to do if they're English speakers I think it's fair for them to learn the guts of this whole thing in English or whatever language you have, okay? And then look at the Pali. But to get around so you can go into any temple and feel comfortable, you need to know the basic pieces, the names of the, uh, the five aggregates, the kinds of feelings, the four noble truths, the eightfold path and the pieces of the dependent origination and how things work. You need the principal stuff in Pali, those words, and then you're fine. I was actually a guinea pig. I was an experiment, and I didn't know I was an experiment for almost two years. I'm naive. I just went along with everything. And the experiment was, can this woman learn this in English if I don't tell her any Pali at all? What's the effect of teaching an average person? this teaching and see what happens. And he told me later, I was just sort of an experiment that stayed around all the time and was devoted to it. So he ran a few years of an experiment. It came out all right. <laughs> it came out all right. <laughs> any other questions? Yeah. I have a question on section 22. Mm -hmm. uh, the sutta, it says that uh, he understands thus, if I were to direct this economy to purified and bright, so purified and bright to the base of infinite space and to develop my mind accordingly, this would be conditioned. Is it like, uh, is it is 
is there a decision he decides to direct what does, okay the question is what does conditioned mean yeah what does that mean when it says it would be conditioned what does that mean uh he will be in that state for a long time no when i tell you a state is conditioned anything uh, okay nibbana is an unconditioned state but we live in a conventional reality where everything is conditioned and in this state whatever arises passes away that's what conditioning means okay one of the problems anyone learning the teaching has with these uh with talking about making an attainment or having an experience is running away with the experience as if sort of god has spoken to me and i've been touched and now i'm <laughs> this way and all it was was a state of existence that arose when conditions were right and it was there for a period of time and it passed away this is what it means by the conditioned state the unconditioned state you don't worry about that anymore can i uh, uh, say one thing yes uh, uh, one uh, one of the things is that you can direct your mind to it, uh, towards uh, a state or a jhana by yes. determinations and the second is that it can also happen when the conditions are right on its own without your uh, specific direction so th this can be two ways you can uh, fall into a jhana right does that so, answer yeah yeah both both uh, together it answered my question yeah so people people get real concerned with it you know arising and passing away and if it's arising why can't i keep it why can't i put it in my pocket and just pull it out and use it again tomorrow <laughs> go into the another session have you been at a retreat you want to go back in the, in the middle of the retreat you want you had a really great report and then you come in the next day and you say well how long did you sit and you sat for like 3 hours say the yesterday and you said i only sat for an hour why well i couldn't make it happen again <laughs> or i really that was so great yesterday i just came back so excited i wanted it to happen again the moment you here's a rule for you the moment you want it you can't have it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the moment i want it <laughs> you can't have it. you can't have it. like a game uh, okay i have one more uh, one more uh, explanation okay. for this sentence uh, like uh, he does not form any condition or generate any volition tending towards either being or non being is it like the volition he does not what is volition then this one what is volition uh holding on to like i if any if anything arises and uh following that no say that say that say the phrase again that you said that it was in it does not form any condition or generate any volition tending towards either being or non being right it does not form any okay, condition okay number one what it's talking about is really really strong equanimity you know when you get to be an arahant you have imperturbability which is absolutely an undisturbable mind it's a bummer imperturbable mind and undisturbable mind <laughs> okay all right so what it's saying is um forming any okay generating volition to generate volition has to have atta driving it volition means will just remember that definition volition means will now i'll tell you a secret um this is why um like in in bikkhobodi's translation uh, and you have to understand bikkhobodi's translation in majima nikaya was um because you're talking about uh nanamoli's work that bikkhobodi finished and then you have to look at the age nanamoli was and you have to understand he was from the group of monks who were totally dictated to completely dictated to by the vasudhi maga saying what the buddha meant you have to go there to oh, boys is a tricky <laughs> so 
So we don't know exactly where this came from, but in the dependent origination and in keeping with this translation, Bhikkhu Bodhi opts to go to the word volition. So why am I disturbed by the word volition? When you have um, nothing's there and you have ignorance as condition, formations arise. But now if nothing was there and you say volitional formations were arose, volitional formations arise, what the heck does that mean? And so when Bhante and I talk about it, we try to talk about it formations. We don't say volitional. Now, let me show you something that happens with translations that went one step beyond that with someone else who took this word uh, volition, uh, took the word uh, formation, and um, he believed in that word volitional, okay? And I don't know, I never had a chance to talk to him. I, I wish I could just go there and sit down and talk to him, but it's not easy for him to talk to a nun sometimes, you know? <laughs> so I don't know how far I get, but maybe if I wrote and said my name was, I don't know, somebody else that was male, that <laughs> would work, I don't know. Anyway, anyway, volitional is implying um, somebody is there, a volitional formation. To me, that's implying somebody's there. You work with your dictionaries and come back and tell me what you think, especially Mirko. Check this out in some dictionaries too, okay? But if you change the word formation to fabrication, now we say fabrication, this gets even more exciting. <laughs> because if you say um, volitional fabrication, I think the reason the person changed formation to fabrication was because he believed in leaving volitional there and having it something to do with a personal thing. That's what I believe. The reason I'm saying that is because the moment you say fabrication, the question arises, who fabricated, right? Am I right? If I say fabrication, if I say to you formation, you don't always come up with who formed it. <laughs> that you can say what formed it, why did it form, but you don't always come up with who formed it, right? Okay, good. But now, the, from a scientific point of view, but when you get into fabrication, you're in the industrial revolution and you're fabricating. <laughs> when you get to fabricating something in a me me mechanic, you know, manufacturing, who is fabricating? And there's nobody there yet. There's nobody there. Because with ignorance as formation, um, as ignorance as condition, formations arise. With formations as condition, consciousness arrives. There couldn't have been a who without a consciousness, could there? You see where I'm going? <laughs> That's really funny. And then, and then you say with consciousness as condition, mentality, materiality, um, arises. We say, mental, of course, all of these links have individual volumes and theses written about one particular link. So you could go all over the place with this thing. But remember, I'm trying to stay in the confines of a, an operational search here that can move us down the path, okay? So you have ignorance as, con as condition, formations arise, formations as condition, Consciousness arises, consciousness is, as condition. Mentality, materiality arise. Now here is your working definition for mentality, materiality. To experience anything when this person is, is actually operational, they have a mental process within the being and they have a, um, a material operation. And when we get to the next link with those two as condition, a mental process operating with this conscious pool where the mental process works. They also have a material ear, eye, nose, tongue, body to work with. Get it? Okay. So then the next one is um, the six sense doors. Now these six sense doors, you got eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. So you have five for the external experience and one for the internal experience. And the mental process also works through each one of the sense doors as part of its operation, right? Right, 
Okay. So the sixth sense stores is condition you have contact, or contact as condition. You, uh, six sense stores, you, you know, six sense stores um, as condition you have contact, but contact happens through the operating material ear and the ear consciousness, which is part of the mental part of this operation, right? And the sound which came to the ear. Three pieces make contact happen. When contact as conditioned feeling arises, felt as pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant, we don't need to go to 128 kinds of feeling. We can be happy with five. I'll let you go to five. I'll always let you go to five, okay? You have pleasant, painful, neutral bodily feelings and pleasant and painful, pleasant, painful, mental, pleasant, painful, bodily, pleasant, painful, and neutral. That's five. I'll let you have that. Okay, but you only need two to get to Nibbana, pleasant or painful, cut and dry. When you get to reciting Chichaka Sutta, you want to have the neither pleasant nor painful uh, feeling because you want to be able to get to that other phrase, don't you? With the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape. You have to get to that, that, that phrase. It's important. So now you've got this feeling, and then with feeling as condition is the craving, and that's a new section of the dependent origination. We're going to do this in a class by itself too, but that's a new section of this dependent origination because the old one down here was like yellow and green. The yellow ones were, were sort of um, preparation parts. That was um, formations in consciousness, okay? Mentality, materiality, six sense doors, and uh, was green, and the contact, I think. No, contact is, starts to be red. No, I guess craving is the first red one. Yeah. And craving is where the red zone starts. With craving is where something else starts besides craving. What is it that makes the craving happen? Me. I do. I crave. You take any of the verbs involved in trouble in the world for the human being, love, hate, <laughs> jealous, all this, nothing works without a, a pronoun. He is, she is, I am. See, once you've got them moving, you can't, they can't move. They're just sitting words on a page. Unless there's a pronoun that's operating with them. So this is the red zone. I like or I don't like mind. And then I don't like it because I remember and it was this way and I didn't like that and I don't like this either, et cetera. That's the clinging. And then the next section is, and this happened to me before and this is like what happened before. So I'm gonna pull this one out and we're gonna do this the same way we did before, but I'm gonna do it I, I, I. And this is like your, your, uh, your vocal practice period. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I, 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 we're in trouble again. That's all this is a red zone. And it keeps getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And it keeps getting stronger and stronger. So when we look at it in terms of all of this, this is where this is going, see? Is, is this heat of movement going along. And I can't remember what your question was about the formations. So volitional race, you need to remember the way, the way to put it together is formations. Um, you can change that word. Bunty and I just got to a place about another word and we kind of like it, preparations. Preparation. You can say preparations arise. And actually, it wasn't us. It was another, I think it was a Mahatera monk wrote something, and it looked, it sounded really good. Preparations. Because why? Because nothing's there yet. It's a preparatory scene or set so everything can operate. And when the consciousness comes in and activates it again in the being coming alive, and what's the first one? I'm hungry. I want my mommy. <laughs> That's the first one somewhere in there. Okay. 
no in this context i'll say, tell you one thing uh, that uh, in this context uh, it is saying that your mind will not move so it will be stable your mind is not what will not move uh, what uh, the statement he is saying yeah uh, that yeah. means that uh, the mind will not move on its own it will be which uh, which, which i'm sorry which one was it which one in the Can book once again which one in the book um, um, I think verse section uh, is uh, section 22. 22. Yeah. And uh, it comes like there is a sentence. Okay. Yeah. The conditioned part of it is just though it arises and passes away. That's a big part of the teaching. Mm -hmm. And what you're after is examining. Um, examining the condition where examining and um oh how do i say it examining and existing in a place where there's no conditions at all and that's the experience of the state of nibbana there's there's no way to tell you what it is i can only tell you what it isn't i can tell you what it isn't but i can't tell you what it is irritating <laughs> let me say both answers together like uh the dependent origination and uh, mind does not move uh, kind of answered my question. Okay, good. Anybody else? I heard another person. Is there one more? Anybody? Okay. So now what we're going to do um, one, one minor thing, please. Uh, yeah. Just a quick question. In, in the end of the sutta, um, when he yeah. asks for forgiveness, um, the, oh, the Buddha uh, re replies with a we. What is meant with this we? We forgive you. When the Buddha speaks, he speaks for all of the monks and himself. So that's what he means by we forgive you. Okay. okay. He in terms of that. Okay. But what the, uh -huh. but the issue was, what the issue was this, when um, the Buddha came in there, the Buddha didn't tell him who it was. He didn't say who he was. And yeah. he was speaking, he remember he's an unordained, well, the monks in those times, the monks would say friend to each other, okay? Yeah, yeah. And, but high respectability to the monk, but uh, to the Buddha, but friend to each other. But he 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 spoke to him like he was one of the fr a friend, yeah. another yeah. monastic. He didn't realize who he was, and then he felt he just felt like, wow, what have I done? I've referred to him as oh, a friend. Okay. He's not a friend. He's the master. He's actually yeah. my master, and I didn't even know I was here. It's such a thrilling thing to see this man come from, but Bhikkhu Bodhi told me it was way far away. He came to, to, this, to go to Sawati. And the way that he came and that he was actually gonna find the Buddha and actually have him teach him before he, was, before he died. It was amazing, but it still yeah. gets you that all that and <laughs> a stray cow. Yeah. 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 Anybody else? Okay. I do. Okay. Anybody? Last chance. Okay, on Wednesday, we'll be talking about the Four Noble Truths in a much deeper kind of way to understand what were they really and what were they for? Were they used for something in particular in the time of the Buddha, during the time he was teaching? How, what were these, these statements? And um, you'll kind of have fun with it, I hope. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so. Three materials for the four uh, noble truths. I'm sorry, what? The study materials. We're working on it. We're not quite finished. We'll okay. get it to you earlier this time than we did before. We're not quite finished. I think if we work the rest of the way through tomorrow, we're trying to get ahead of this, right? And um, I guess that's all I have for you. Um, Ten minutes. Yes, let's do that. Let's share merit. Okay. 
May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.